During the solstice, there's, you know, two solstices a year, and, and especially during the one in, I think it's June 23rd, all of these sacred sites that the Inca considered to be sacred, they call them huacas. Uh, a lot of people don't realize, you know, there's these massive, incredible sites like Machu Picchu and Sacsayhuaman. But if you go up into the, the, the Cusco Highlands way up, way off the beaten path in the remote hills, guess what you find? You find just precision, what looks like altar uh, portals all over. Again, I, th those were made by the earlier builders, I believe. The Inca would bring out these elongated skulled mummies, you know, that existed before them. And they would place these in the huacas. And when the solstice would hit, according to Inca oral tradition and legend, these elongated skull mummies would become animated. All things continually lead back to serpents, dragons, fairies, Nephilim, and fallen angels. In the distance looms a mystical mountain. As Mike Kaiser used to say, if it's in the Bible and it's weird, it's probably important. At its peak, a great fire burns, concealing the Prometheus lands. This, this development of this knowledge that's being talked about within the mystery schools. An ancient artifact said to reveal the hidden truth within a deliberately darkened world. There is a hidden history that's been deliberately obfuscated from the peoples of the world. Join us as we travel and explore the vast unknown. It's a hero's journey with dragons to slay, damsels to save, and innumerable treasures to hoard. Torches high. The Smithsonian, they caught wind of a giant skeleton. They would send their agents out to get it. But it takes courage to move forward, to move out of the shadows, out of the uh, unreality that we think of as reality. We are all on the hero's journey. Mankind has been in contact with and influenced by extraterrestrials. Leave the Sitchin mound of bull feathers out of it. You know, look at it from a different perspective. A different perspective. Different perspective. What is happening and what is up? Hold out your glass, because we're about to fill it up. Welcome to the Prometheus Lens Podcast, the place where the conversations are always enlightening. I'm your host, Justin. Here, we like to use the allegory of the Prometheus Lens to take a second look at everything. Well, guys, thank you for tuning in. If you haven't done so already, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button. The socials will be coming down below. But uh, got a great episode for you guys today. This is a, a guy that I discovered him just a couple years ago and just been eating up his content. If you're into alternative history, ancient lost technology, megalithic sites, this is the, the episode that you're going to get to nerd out with us on. And I know you're going to thoroughly enjoy it because I got a great guest for you lined up today. I got to Derek Olson from Megalithic Marvels and Stargate Voyager here with us today. Derek, thank you so much for coming on. Justin, thanks for the invite. Always fun to talk about ancient subjects like we're going to get into, and I really hope that the uh, listeners, the audience, uh, enjoy this talk. Oh, I know they will, man. Uh, this is this stuff's right up our alley. We talk about stuff like this all the time, so I know they're going to really enjoy this conversation. Uh, but for those that are just dipping their toes in, haven't went off the, the deep end yet and not been exposed to your material and stuff, just uh, give us an introduction and synopsis, you know, who Derek Olson is and what you do and how you got into this space. Yeah, great question. You know, as a kid growing up, I was always fascinated by history, ancient history, dinosaurs, stuff of that nature. And I uh, was always asking questions about it. You know, I'd read about these giants in uh, the Bible. And uh, I remember always asking, uh, you know, my parents about what's going on here and never could get a whole lot of answers. Um, fast forward to like 2012. I think it was, um, I was living in California at the time 
And I remember one day I was just doing an internet search on my day off, you know, ancient structures. And um, one of the images that pops up is this megalithic mortarless wall in Peru. Again, this is 2012. And I'm going, back then I'm going, how have I never seen this before? It was, you know, one of these infamous uh Pictures of like Saxe Maman, it's one of the premier sites there in Peru, Cusco area, with that features like 100 ton blocks that are precision cut, and you can't fit a hair through these joints. And again, without knowing anything that I know now, I just remember my critical thoughts kicking in. How have I never seen this before? This is superior to any of the ancient ruins that I've I've seen, you know, growing up and read about in history class and seen in the books and on the History Channel or whatever it was back then. And so that kind of led me down this trail of, okay, what what's special about these, the supposed wall in Peru? And, you know, the first stuff that you start to find is the mainstream narrative. Oh, this is just the Inca, right? Well, then you dig deeper and, uh, you know, I got to give credit to Brian Forster, uh, another researcher who was really groundbreaking on YouTube with his videos featuring um, what he calls lost technology in Peru. And so uh, bumping into his material, I soon realized, okay, there's way more going on here. There's no way the Inca could have made this. When you look at the tools they had, according to the archaeological record, the Inca had mm -hmm. copper chisels and hammers, and the Inca were an incredible civilization. I mean, what they built was amazing, yet totally inferior to this uh, older, superior megalithic construction made of harder material, granite or andesite, way harder than the tools the Inca had. So one... It would take them forever just to blunt force these objects as it bends their tools. Two, there's no way they could have precision cut it. And so it was that kind of knowledge that really just revved up my engines for ancient history. And uh, several years later, I found myself uh, on a trip to Peru with Brian Forster on one of his tours. And so I got to see these walls up close and touch them. And uh, that just took me to a whole nother level of research. Um, I had all this, all these photographs and all this video footage that I took. Oh, and down there is where I, right where I got to see these elongated skulls up close and in person. I went to Paracas. Yeah, I love your shirt. Yeah, I got a replica back here too. <laughs> Do you? Yeah, I see it. Okay, yeah. So I got to see these things up close. Wow. And um, I knew without a shadow of a doubt, okay, we've got megalithic walls and lost technology, but now I have actual skulls I can see that there's no way this is just human when you consider all the genetic anatomical um, anomalies that these skulls present. Uh, larger eye sockets than ours. A lot of them have larger jaws. As you probably know, missing sagittal sutures, the foramen magnum where the neck attaches to the head on our skulls, it's in the, in the center middle. Their skulls, it's in the far back. And then, of course, um, a lot of them have 25, 30% larger cranial volume than ours. Some of them have up to 50% larger. Like uh, there's one skull known as the Chango skull in the Ica Museum. And so seeing that one, I was blown away. And of course, they forbid any photography of it. <laughs> I was um, doing my best to break that rule, but I just couldn't quite do it. That's uh, what I was, was about to ask. But did you get it? Did you get one? I was trying, but the guards were, boy, they were just too many. Um and so, yeah, seeing these skulls, seeing the walls, I came home with all this footage and I just had to do something with it. And that's when I realized, you know what, I'm going to start a blog. And I started megalithicmarvels.com and uh, just started to 
do little blog posts about the sites I visited and elongated skulls. And then I started to write more and I started, you know, I think an Instagram account, YouTube. And I was just surprised how fast this stuff started to take off is there was such a, a hunger and thirst for this. And, um, here I am, what, six, seven years later. And it, it's, it's really exciting times to be alive because Unlike back in 2016, 17, when I really started my channels and the blog, now fast forward to 2024, I mean, it is crazy how eyes have been opened. And when it comes to hit, you know, people realize a lot of people that there's such a thing now as fake news. They now realize there's such a thing as fake history mm -hmm. and they're hungry for the knowledge of the truth. And so they're searching for it on social media on blogs. And so it's fun to get to be a part of uh, Awakening Minds. And, um, you know, my approach to all this is not to say I've got it all figured out. I just like to show the, um, the footage. I like to ask a lot of questions and let people make up their own minds. And it's really exciting now to do my own tours and go out and see these sites a couple times a year now. Yeah, that's awesome. And that's cool that, uh, you know, Peru w w was your, your gateway drug. I mean, that is a, just a, a fascinating place. And, uh, Brian Forrester, I, I've bought almost every book that he's put out so much great material in there. And, uh, I've actually been, uh, talking back and forth w with Brian, trying to get, get him lined up to come on the show. We just got to get the dates and stuff worked out. So that's cool. Cause I've actually been looking into going on one of his tours too. And that, that's how it all got started for you. That, that's pretty awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 It's, it's awesome. And um, yeah, I'm going back to Peru this August. And so uh shameless plug, if anyone's interested, um, I think it's August 1st to the 12th. It's a Peru and Bolivia tour. And uh, we're going to see 20 plus sites in through April 30th. I believe you can still get 500 off. So you can go to stargatevoyager.com slash tours for all the info. Nice. I guess, you know, since, since we've done uh peered into there, let's, you know, kind of deep dive on Peru. Cause I mean, that that's fascinating, you know, to me, the, the holy long good at schools like you talked about. And even with the, the head binding, you know, like growing up in school, you know, we were shown glimpses of stuff like this, but it's just little glimpses. And, um, it's like they explain it away. Oh, well, this is from head binding. You know, this is from, uh, uh, wrapping with, with tight claws and, and, uh, just doing this D, you know, this cranial deformation. And then they just turn the page and boom, that, that's it. Of course, as a kid, I'm like, well, that's just strange. You know, why the, why the hell would they do that? You know what I mean? Just normal questions. But then when you go through and, and start looking at this, you know, some of these, yes, are from head binding, but there's many that are clearly not because, like you said, the cranius magnum, uh, all the head binding uh, skulls they have found, it still mounts at the same spot. Squeezing your head doesn't change where your neck, you know, attaches to your skull. And yes, it makes it elongated, but it doesn't increase the the brain case volume. These, you know, and it doesn't make the Sagar Sutras disappear. You know, all these things that they're finding, there's many of them down there that clearly show, I mean, that these are not, you know, what we define as, as humanoid. It's some kind of hybrid race. Yeah, and even in the past five plus years, if all that other, you know, evidence that we just laid out about these skulls being more than just human isn't enough, Within the past five plus years, there's been a bunch of discoveries of these um, newborn infants born right out of the womb with huge elongated skulls. And I don't know if you've seen any photos of these. I've got some of them featured on, again, my blogs or my social media channels. But these are, uh, again, newborn babies and infants with huge skulls. And um, some of their skulls are larger than a lot of the adult skulls you see. So again, more proof, this is genetic. And you're right on, Justin. 
it gets a little confusing because yes, mixed in with what, what we call these naturally elongated skulls are um, all kinds of skulls that were just head head bound right through cranial deformation, and those were the um, that was just the normal population of the day trying to look like the ruling class. Does that make mm-hmm. sense? So they they were trying to be like their uh, godlike rulers. And um, and so, but even in the Paracas Museum that you go to there, they've got some of these elongated skulls right next to the um, normal human skulls. And when you see them next side by side, it's just no comparison. Such, yeah, there's no comparison. It's like that is completely different than that. But something else I'll share is on my last Peru trip here, I mean, it was incredible, you know, because every every time you go on a trip, you learn so much more, especially, you know, from the guides. And we had some of the best guides, I believe, in Peru who literally come from Inca lineage. Um, and these are licensed, you know, uh, tour guides. And it's it's very strict to be a tour guide in Peru. You have to go through exhaustive training. Um, yet we handpicked the guides that we found out um, don't pull the mainstream narrative. And so, you know, they're, they're wise about it. When you're in the huge overpopulated spots, they kind of got to pipe the, the normal narrative. But then when you get away from um, the watching eyes, that's when they tell you the real oral traditions. And, um, it was so incredible to talk with these guides um, because one of the elongated skulls we saw is halfway between, uh, it's about an hour south of Cusco. There's a museum, I'm blanking on the name, but there's a one of the most infamous elongated skull mummies is there. His, it, the it, goes by the na- it goes by the name of Waiki. Oh, okay. And, um, is that just the one that's a- missing an arm? Um, Yuki. Yeah, it might be missing an arm, but it's got real long, uh, well, it's got at least one real long arm, a huge skull with a hole in the top, huge eye sockets. This is one you see a lot. And, um, anyway, this is a total humanoid, right? Um, but the point is during the time of the Inca, this was their most valuable possessions were these, elongated skulled mummies because the Inca realized this was the previous ruling class. These were the uh, godlike um, teachers. And so um, the Inca, again, if you come from the standpoint of they didn't make all these giant megalithic sites, they just came along later and built on top of them and repurposed them. Um, during the solstice, there's, you know, two solstices a year and, and especially during the one in, I think it's June 23rd, all of these sacred sites that the Inca considered to be sacred, they call them huacas. Uh, a lot of people don't realize, you know, there's these massive, incredible sites like Machu Picchu and Sacsayhuaman. But if you go up into the, the, the Cusco Highlands way up, way off the beaten path in the remote hills, Guess what you find? You find just precision, what looks like altar uh, portals all over. Again, I, th- those were made by the earlier builders, I believe. But the Inca came along and turned them into places of worship. Where I'm going with this is the Inca would bring out these elongated skulled mummies, you know, that existed before them. And they would place these in the huacas. And when the solstice would hit, according to Inca oral tradition and legend, these elongated skull mummies would become animated and would, and would telepathically speak to the Inca. And they would give them orders and command wow. sacrifices and, um, 
and they would be worshipped. You know, I always said that I would never bow to any corporate sponsor. But hey, Kevlar Joe's ain't corporate. Kevlar Joe's a small business, brewing up big flavor. Nick's just a nine to five Joe, just like the rest of us guys, but he has a passion for great coffee. After countless cups of steel coffee on deployment, he decided to make his own brew. After years of perfecting his craft, decided to share it with the world. Head on over to KevlarJoe.com for some coffee that's never going to give you up, never going to let you down, never going to turn around and desert you. <laughs> be bold, be humble, be Kevlar. KevlarJoe.com, guys. Hey, guys, got a call to action for you. If you guys are enjoying the episode and have not done so already, smash that like button smash that subscribe button and if you're listening on a podcast platform please take the time to give us a five-star review this helps us to grow the show and to reach new listeners back to the episode the highest level of the three worlds or the frame of mind and this is represented by the condor and so it's crazy all over and i, I feature a lot of these like on my youtube and instagram you'll see these three animals I'm about to share embedded all over into the megalithic walls. One of my favorite sites, Oyante Tambo in the Sacred Valley, not far from Machu Picchu. Literally, it's got some of the famous megalithic walls you've seen pictures of. But there's a part of it called the Temple of the Condor. And you walk over and there's this epic megalithic wall. But you look up and you realize they've shaped the literal mountain outcropping itself into a, a literal condor. Head, beak. And this thing is ancient, yet it's still very clear to see. Right? And so um, this was the Hanan Pacha. These were the this was the first culture, the uh, you know, what I believe was the golden age builders, right? The pre-Diluvians. Yeah, when gods so walked amongst men. Yeah, that's level one. And then the level two, they call it the Uran Pacha. This is the second culture. And these guys still had um, an abundance of knowledge of this lost technology. And according to the Inca, they engineered the smaller size precision mortarless walls that you see like at the Cori Concha. Um they're still megalithic, but they're just small and like intricate precision. It's got a different look. It's not the massive scale, but it's just beautiful and ornate and precision. And these guys represent the uh, mid-level of consciousness. And this is represented by the Puma that you see everywhere. Even the city of Cusco, if you see an aerial view shot of it, there is uh, images you can find on Online, where it's, you can see the, the shape of the, the puma. And then lastly, there's the Ukan Pacha. And this is the third culture. This is either the Wari culture or the Inca. Wari came right before the Inca. And so these guys built on top of the first two. And the Inca themselves admit this. You know, we didn't build this. We built on top of it. But it's amazing. The, the Inca did not interfere with the other works. They just uh, harmoniously added to what existed before. Um, so that's pretty cool. And the uh, the third level there is represented by the serpent uh, that you just see embedded all over too. Um, stones all over Cusco. You'll see the the serpent imagery snaking everywhere. So it's just really crazy to think about all the cosmology there and the oral traditions. You know, I feel like there's so much we can learn from that and learn from the locals who've had this knowledge passed down. And, that, and that's one of those things too. It's, it's upsetting to, to people, you know, like me and, and you that love getting into the history and, and finding these things is we have to rely now on these oral traditions because when the conquistadors showed up and then the Roman Catholic church, 
they gathered up all the the texts and scrolls and uh, all the information and just destroyed it all. You know, they, they seen it as, you know, beliefs of, of heathen people worshiping false gods and just destroyed everything. So, I mean, that's why Peru is such a mystery. There's so much there that was just destroyed and lost forever that we'll just never know. And what do they call it? The, the Kipshu? Where they would, uh, they found a few of them left that people had hid away, but basically where they would weave these, uh, look like, uh, like spider web basically, and they, they tie knots in it and tie them together. And it was basically, they believed it to be just, uh, decoration at first, but then they found out that this was a, a way of stealing, uh, telling stories and had encoded messages and like the knots symbolized numbers and different things like that. A few of those have survived, but they're just now, trying to figure out how to decode them yeah i know exactly there's so much there's so much to peru and um and really even bolivia down there in puma punku everything around lake titicaca is so ancient and um a lot of people have seen photos of the h blocks these precision blocks at puma punku um according to the experts that's only like 10 percent at best of what's actually under the ground. And you would think, you know, the government of Bolivia with this wealth of ancient history there would carefully being be, be excavating this. Um, but it's like, they're not touching it. You know, it's just, it's like they don't want anybody looking underneath there um, because it's just the tip of the iceberg. Literally what we see from what's underground and Easter uh, Island, prime example. Oh yeah, yeah. So digging, Island, man, they found a whole freaking statue, like eighteen feet tall. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And there's, uh, you said Easter Island, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's even a um, megalithic. There's one megalithic wall still left on Easter Island. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that, and it's just like the walls you'd see in Peru. So there was this civilization. Um, connected all over the earth again, I believe in, in this golden age that we talk about. And they had knowledge that spanned all over to Egypt where you see, uh, almost the same, uh, megalithic architecture, you know, with the nubs, same coming, serpent imagery, same serpent imagery. Right. And so it was like there was, uh, these earth grids. But the ancients knew so much more about the earth and the earth's magnetism. And it was the geology of stone mixed with these magnetic spots aligned with the constellations. Um, they had a technology far superior, I believe, to what we have today. And it just, it looked completely different, but it was holistic. It was organic in nature. And, um, it's just it's just really mind blowing to consider. So I know I've said a lot there. Oh, I mean it is, and that's one thing is uh, a lot of people. And this is even this is the the lower end of the fringe mm -hmm. spectrum. But you know, a lot of people will say that uh, how you know Columbus wasn't the first to set sail. You know, there was ancient peoples, you know, circumnavigating the globe, you know, long, long, long before Columbus. And then that guy, uh, I think his name was Thor. He was like a Norwegian uh, uh, historian or archaeologist or scientist. He built like this little reed boat and just threw up a little sail and just let the, the wind and current take him. And it took him uh, straight into like the Virgin Islands area. Yeah, Thor hired all. Yes. Yeah. So that shows you, I mean, a little bitty reed boat and a sail with, with no oars, no crew, just let the ocean current and wind take you. It, it takes you straight into there. And even people that propose that get shunned by mainstream archaeology as fringe, you know, or as a pseudo archaeologist. Yeah, no, I mean, there's so much to history and you know, man, Easter Island, Peru, South America, Egypt. You know, I like to say, and I'm I'm not the first one that said this, that, um, you know, those who control the past 
control the future, right? And I think that's why there's a cover up. I mean, we can see today, and I don't want to get political, but we can see the massive effort by the mainstream media and political powers that be to, you know, uh, give us a, a daily dose of fake news. And if they'll work that hard to hide today's real news from us, what lengths do you think they'll go to hide our real history from us? Mm -hmm. And I believe that's exactly what they've done. Again, because those who control the past control the future. And so they strategically disinform us regarding the prehistoric past. And um, then they turn around and accuse guys like Graham Hancock of spreading disinformation, right? And he's been one of the you know, guys leading the charge in alternative history, basically saying that there's, there's a lot more than we've been told, right? We're people History's suffering from amnesia, as he says. Right. And so, um, you know, like Egyptologists, those are, you know, the guys who study pharaonic Egypt. Egyptologists tell us that the pharaonic dynasties or the dynastic e Egyptians, as they're called, who emerged around 3000 BC, they tell us that they created the pyramids as tombs, right? Um, but unlike the confirmed dynastic Egyptian tombs in the Valley of the Kings, um, which are colorful and full of Egyptian artwork depictions and tombs, you know, why have no hieroglyphs, mummies, or Egyptian artwork depictions ever been found on the bare megalithic walls of the Great Pyramids. And the Valley of the Kings, by the way, once you go to Egypt, it's shocking to realize that's an eight-hour car drive away. It's like multiple states away from the Great Pyramids, right? But they want you to believe it's right next door. And so it's these kind of things you learn that makes you go, huh. And then when you're crawling through the Great Pyramid, or most of these pyramids, I mean, you just immediately realize this feels almost like a machine. This feels like, you know, in our modern day, they've put all these um, wooden planks and staircases down so you can get down. Like in the Great Pyramid, there's a 300-foot steep um, descending passageway that takes you down to the subterranean chamber. It is backbreaking to go down that holding the rails with, you know, nothing on but a small backpack. How would the dynastic Egyptians traverse through there in a, um, in a funeral procession holding, you know, huge artifacts and sarcophaguses, right? Oh, and then by the way, that's without any stairs or railings. It would be like a slipping slide straight down, right? And I don't think they'd ever be able to get back up. So those are the kind of things that make you go, okay, there's no way this was just a tomb. Now, the key is it probably, a lot of the Egyptian pyramids were repurposed as tombs by the dynastic Egyptians, right? The pharaohs, and again, when I say Dynastic Egyptians, I'm talking about the guys like Khufu, Khafre, King Tut. These guys that emerged about 3000 BC, they get the credit for making all this stuff. But again, like the Inca in Peru, I believe they just found it and repurposed it and they tagged it. You know, they inscribed their names. Well, us dummies today see their names and we go, oh, they built it. <laughs> right? Uh, I mean, that's like, um, me scribbling my name into uh, uh, something, and yeah, you know, the bathroom trying to take, style wall. That's like yeah. me and scribbing my name into uh, Trump Tower or something, and claiming credit for it. Uh, that's a bad example, but you know what I'm trying to say. Um, so, and and these these um. The pre, you know, our, our tour guide in Egypt, his name is Muhammad Ibrahim. Yeah. You did a great interview with him. I really enjoyed that. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Guy's brilliant. Um, and he, he refers to the 
what he calls the real builders of the pyramid as the pre-Diluvians, the pre-Diluvian ancient Egyptians. And it's crazy. You know, my biggest takeaway from Egypt the last couple of years I've been, it's not the pyramids as amazing as they are. It's not the megalithic temples as amazing as they are. It's the megalithic statues. Because these statues, I'm not, again, I'm not talking about the dynastic ones that were made to copy the original ones. I'm talking about, um, listener, listeners and viewers can Google, um, giant statue at the Ram Museum, for example. You'll see the remnants of a 1000 ton statue. This thing is, again, prehistoric, badly damaged, but you can still see the precision work done. It was, it was crafted from one piece of granite. The thing is depicting who these golden age rulers were and what they looked like. The dynastic Egyptians came along later and copied that. In this thing is, is embedded precision laser like 3D symbols. Again, cut into granite. And then on the base of the statue at the Ram Museum in Luxor, there's literally what we would call hieroglyphs, hieroglyphics. What's really going on here is this is the original language and symbol of the Golden Age antediluvian Egyptians. This was their language. These were their symbols. The dynastic Egyptians still had knowledge of this and, you know, adopted those and, and kept like their the language seconds, going. Like the second peoples of Peru. The second people, yeah. So, again, that's what's so crazy is this whole – um Look of the Egyptians. This is what these, I believe these golden age prehistoric rulers, uh, ruling class looked like. They were, um, fascinating to behold. And again, they had this holistic technology. They didn't need to blow stuff up. They didn't need to pollute the skies. Um, they, knew about geology and water and magnetism and the constellations and um, built the greatest society that we know of, right? So, so much I could talk about. Yeah, and it's amazing too because when I look at stuff or try to study something, I always look for common themes. You know, I'm not a coincidence conspiracy, you know, conspiracy guy. If I see... You know, serpents and megalithic stru structures over here. I see it over here and I see it over here. And then I hear from this side of the world that, no, we didn't build it. The star people did. Or, no, we didn't build it. We found it. And, you know, I mean, all these things are common themes. There has to be something to it. And uh, you had mentioned Graham Hancock. Uh, I've been uh, reading his books and listening to his stuff here recently and just, just fascinating uh, work. But I, I'm really fond of how he talks about, you know, uh, astral archaeology. And even by lining up these sites with the stars, we can determine dates and, and things and how he, and he's of the opinion too, that, the Great Pyramid uh, of Giza and uh, the Sphinx, all these things point to a, a pre-flood world. That one time, this Sphinx was staring at the, the, the summer solstice sunrise and that the, the pyramids line up with the, the belt of Orion and that the, uh, the Nile mirrors the Milky Way. And that even uh, one of the chambers going up at, uh, out of the Great Pyramid lines up with the, uh, the Milky Way galaxy. And uh, how he talks about just all these ancient religions talked about at death, you took a trip through the seven spheres and went into the Milky Way. And that basically this was a, a temple to basically shoot the, the the spirit up toward the Milky Way on its spiritual journey. Uh, that's the, I mean, what, what's your opinions on that? Or uh, have you ever thought about that? Looking at the, some of these sites, just the astral archaeology and stuff involved with it. Oh yeah. It's, 
you're you're right on with that. I mean, you know, you mentioned. Um, I, w- I was going to mention something clicked in my mind. I don't know if you've studied anything about Leonardo's Da Vinci's secret trips to the Great Pyramid. Hmm. Um, you know, I've I was never really a student of anything Leonardo da Vinci and. I always thought the Da Vinci Code was just a bunch of BS. Um, but I interviewed somebody named Robert Edward Grant, who really shared some compelling evidence, and he's gotten this from other sources too. Da Vinci, you know, was one of these brilliant artists, brilliant mind. Well, if you kind of look at the history timeline, he basically disappears from the public view for three years. 1482 through 1486, I believe. And nobody really knew where he was. Um, But based on some cryptic writings he made, uh, chronicled in a letter, um, he was basically in Cairo, Egypt. And he was visiting the Great Pyramid. And uh, he must have had a map somehow. And he was exploring inside the Great Pyramid The point of this is, if you look at his greatest works of art, um, I think the first one he created coming back from this secret trip to Egypt was the Vitruvian Man painting. And if you Google that, you'll see the Vitruvian Man. It's the picture of the guy with his arms stretched out. And um, the Vitruvian Man painting... If you place the Great Pyramid over this painting in the right proportion, the horizontal lines of the painting match exactly where each chamber inside the pyramid is located. It's crazy. And the air shafts of the pyramid even frame the arms of Vitruvian Man. Hmm. And so, and then if you take his greatest masterpiece, The Last Supper, this is wild. And again, I would I would refer you to Robert Edward Grant. Check out his YouTube. He's got videos about uh, all of this. It's way better than how I'm describing it. Um, the Last Supper painting. If you place a photo, again, the right proportions of the King's Chamber, which is considered the Holy of Holies in the Great Pyramid, the room in the Last Supper painting is the exact dimensions. It's the exact look of the King's Chamber. And again, Da Vinci and these master artists were all about hiding stuff. And Easter being eggs. So again, the room of the of the the Last Supper painting is the King's Chamber of the Great Pyramid. And to prove that, if you look carefully, and you you have to use a magnifying glass and have the right light, you'll see that there is hidden in the Last Supper painting. There's birds and there's a, a I believe a cow or a bull hidden on the right side of the wall those are exactly in the king's chamber if you're inside and you're uh, able to shine the right red lights on it they're super faded because they're super ancient um, but again this was the artwork of these original megalithic builders and um, Da Vinci knew that, and they were probably clearer to see to the eye back then, and he encoded them in his paintings. Anyway, that's that was uh, just some free information there, but that just blows my mind that even Da Vinci in the 1400s. Do you have a podcast or small business? Do you want to expose that business or podcast to thousands of people each week for an entire year? for less than one car payment. Now you have my attention. I'm looking for sponsors of this show. I know you have seen and heard the Kevlar Joe ads on the podcast and YouTube channel. I can do the same for your podcast or business each and every week. I promise you, you're not going to find a better advertisement value for your buck. My contact info can be found on my website, PrometheusLensPodcast.com, or reach out to me on social media. Let's talk, and let me show you how you can grow your brand effectively and cheaply.
Are you a member of the All Access Pass yet? If not, what are you waiting for? Join the band of brothers and sisters on this hero's journey. The members community page gets you access to the private community, monthly members chats, and guest Q&As. Also gets you 48 hour early access to all episodes for just five bucks a month. The all access pass gets you all that plus exclusive members only episodes for just 10 bucks a month. If you enjoy the content, this is your way to ensure I get to keep doing this show. This is your way as a listener to sponsor the show. So head on over to PrometheusLensPodcast.com and sign up. All right, guys, back to the episode. Was conscious of, um, of this kind of information, but yeah, we could talk about harmonic resonance, acoustic technology. Uh, I mean, uh, one book I would recommend people check out is the Giza power plant by Chris Dunn, you know, and he concludes that the great pyramid must have been originally built to provide a highly technical society with energy. Um, but again, holistic energy, harmonically, he believes the pyramids were coupled with the earth, where the earth is the power source and the pyramids just tapping into it. And when it resonates with the earth, energy is drawn through it. And so, again, when you look at, you know, thousands of years ago, it's likely that the Nile ran right next to the Great Pyramids. And over 100 feet down, under Giza, is this massive aquifer. And so water was used to produce this electromagnetic field, basically, with resonance that kept this pyramid humming like a machine. And each pyramid was likely tuned to a different frequency of sound. And it's almost like every chamber was specifically designed in advance with acoustics in mind to generate specific sound frequencies. And so... Again, there's so much to frequency, and I think that is a big piece and how they moved these massive granite blocks. One of the greatest enigmas I don't think that people understand. When you go to Egypt, it's not like they said, okay, let's build the Great Pyramid, and they just went and started hacking blocks. Every The pyramid... Did, for it to function, had to have these specific materials. So the Great Pyramid, for example, its outer casing is limestone, but inside this king's chamber and these queen's chambers, are they're made of rose granite. Well, the only place the ancients quarried rose granite is in Aswan. Guess how far away that is from the Great Pyramid? It's like 10 hours away by car, the Aswan Quarry. So how did they move it a 10-hour car ride? Today, we would need, you know, the biggest earth movers to move these. And think about that wouldn't just take 10-hour car ride and going at normal speed. It would take days. And then the opposite's true. When you go down towards the Aswan Quarry, which is near Luxor, the biggest meg, one of the biggest megaliths there are the uh, Colossi of Memnon statues. <sighs> one of my favorite places to go. And I believe these are, these are, uh, these are two giant statues that are basically, um, typify these ancient titans. That once existed. Well, when you look at what they're made of, they're made of a specific limestone. Guess what? The only place where that can be quarried is way up near Giza, another 10 hours away. So that's the mind blowing thing. And it speaks is, to the how they believed it was so sacred, that place. I mean, honestly, I mean, why would they? go through all the trouble and gather all these supplies that was so far away to bring them to this specific spot. And as you said, because now we're just now figuring out that, you know, all these ley lines and, and uh, all this energy that they were trying to tap into at this spot. Exactly. It was sacred to them. 
but it was also easy for them. It was almost like it was effortless for them to quarry this extremely hard rose granite. You know, rose granite from Aswan, it's this reddish pink color that can, contains 20 to 60% quartz. Ex- on the Mohs scale of hardness, that's something important for people to look up the Mohs scale of hardness. It rates the hardness of stone, you know, from one to 10, 10 being like diamond. So rose granite's like a seven or maybe eight sometimes, depending on how much quartz is in there. This is extremely hard stone. Again, guess what kind of tools the dynastic Egypt's, Egyptians had of 3000 BC? Copper chisels and hammers. In some places, they might have had iron. Copper is like a three or four on the Mohs scale. Iron, four, maybe five. It's still way softer than the rose granite. Yeah. No way they could have cut it. And the smoking gun proof of that is going to this Aswan quarry. And I've got videos and pictures of this on my Instagram and YouTube. Uh, our, our guide, Muhammad Ibrahim, he says, now this is how they want us to believe that they quarried this, uh, these obelisks, because that's what the unfinished obelisk is. It's this 1200 ton massive obelisk that's cut on three sides with the bottom still attached. Well, they want us to believe and totally insult our intelligence that this was done by taking a specific kind of rock and just pounding like this. So Muhammad took one minute and was pounding as hard as he could with this softer stone. And he got like a scratch that, you know, a tiny scratch. The point is, if you see this played out, it's an insult to your intelligence. There's no way pounding rocks could even hardly penetrate the rose granite. But then when you go around, there's not just one unfinished obelisk. There's at least three there. When you walk along these, you can see the clear smoking gun proof that they didn't have, that they had lost technology. And you can see the the proof of the tool they used. There is scoop marks on top of and all along the sides of this massive long obelisk, about one meter each. There was a giant crane-like machine they had that could scoop down into the granite like butter and it would curl up and pull back because all along it, you see this, these straight one meter long scoop marks, but then under it, it digs up under it and pulls it out. And this thing was systematically scooping this granite out. And um, again, when you're in there, you realize there's no way a tiny, you know, chisel and hammer (laughs) could could do what this one, these one meter scoops were doing. Again, it was easy. So that is what my favorite those corner rocks. You know what I mean? When I look at those, some of those corner rocks, like on the walls at Peru, they look like they were just heated and bent to shape. Absolutely. That's just wild. Yeah. You see the same thing in Peru. It's like they could soften the stone. And one theory I came away with in Peru was that, you know, the, 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 the infamous nubs people talk about wonder, what were these for? One of our Peruvian guides was telling me, he theorizes that that was the injection point where they, they pushed in this tool to soften it. And when they pulled it out, it left that protruding knob or nub. I thought that was an interesting theory. Yeah, because see, that's what I was thinking. See, I, I work in plastics. You know, I, I do a lot of uh, extrusion work, melting down hard substances and, and pushing them through dyes and making different, uh, you know, materials and, and shapes out of this. And that's what I was about to say is like when we have to purge the machine, we have to run certain material through it and it just basically cleans it by running stuff out. But whatever shape the dye is, you know, if it's just a needle point, it comes out like a like a string noodle, but it falls to the ground and uh, like three D print, and it makes whatever shape or whatever. But when you are done, it always ends in a nipple, 
And the same thing with injection molding. You have a, a die and this uh, screw uh, heats up uh, the barrel of the plastic and squirts it out into this die. And like you said, when it backs out, it always leaves the nipple. But that's pretty wild. Yeah, to me, that was a compelling theory because that's what it looks like when you're there and you, you see this nub protruding out and it it's marshmallow-like, you know, it's like just like something if you've ever cooked marshmallows around the fire, you know, and you see how that so the, the thing that's soft is, is hardening. So. And it's the exact opposite of what is taught to us that's logical because you, you see things progress. You know, uh, Henry Ford didn't build a, a Tesla to start with. You know, you, you have progression. Things get better. You know, as they go, we learn to get better. But in these megalithic sites, everything is flipped on its head. It's like the the Teslas are the first ones, and then it gets crappier as you go. And in Peru, you can see just from the naked eye, a, a layman, somebody that's never even cracked open a book and studied these things, can see you have these huge stones. And then all of a sudden, you have these little boulders stacked on top with all kinds of mortar on the inside to hold it all together. I mean, you can see where they've built on, I mean, with the naked eye, untrained eye. Right. Yeah. It's, yeah, the Inca, their, their construction, I call it just rough stone and mortar. It's, uh, it's just so small and rough and it's right on top of the, the megalithic core, as I would call it. One doesn't look like the other. And you see this everywhere. But downtown Cusco is one of the coolest places to go. It's probably one of the only cities of its size, which is pretty large, where you can go downtown and sit in a restaurant um, right next to a megalithic wall. Like the, so the city's literally built on top of these megalithic walls that have survived. They're that ancient. But you see at least three or four layers of civilization. You see the megalithic. You see um, the Inca above that, the Spanish above that, and then, you know, present day. And literally, you see all these layers. But the megalithic was so anti-seismic, strong, impenetrable, it's still there. And it's, you know, the way it's tilted even i mean it's it's incredible the cory conch is one of the most incredible places if you're ever in cusco um that's an inca word and um it was the crown jewel of the inca empire it was like their you know the cusco was their capital but this was like their premier building um but again i believe it way predates the inca and just the legends about the cory concha alone are so fascinating i mean you see the precision in this place and there's tunnels that run from the Cori Concha. If you look at a map of Cusco that run all the way miles and miles up to Sacsayhuaman. So there was megalithic tunnels. I'm not just talking tunnels dug out tunnels that are lined with megalithic stone. And this is where the Inca were hiding their artifacts when the Spanish came in to conquer. Uh, the priests, the Inca priests went down and were hiding their gold and mo most importantly, these elongated skulled mummies. And so it's just fascinating, the legend, the lore, and, um, you know, the mystery. Oh, definitely. It's just, uh, it's, it's captivating and, uh, to ask the wise and, uh, the Veracocha, you know, I, I think that's just fascinating when you look, like I said, common themes, it's just, but, the uh, Veracocha shows up, you know, from the waters and he has his disciples, the Veracocha and they go and they teach and, teach how to ride, how to build and to civilize these people. And the way, you know, it looks is like, I always look at the, the waters is like allegory, you know, of the, the abyss or talking about this catastrophic event. 
and they come and re civilize all these people. And uh, what was the other god that was just like Veracocha, but he come out of Lake Titicaca? Um, what was his name? Um, okay, yeah. Um, there was Veracocha. Yeah. There was. Um, I know I'm blanking on it since you asked yeah. me. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, but yeah, you know what I'm getting at? All these stories are, are so similar. And then this path of Veracocha. Yeah. As he, you know, all the towns that he stopped and supposedly went to, you see all these megalithic structures popping up. And every single time, without exception, is where you find all these elongated skulls along this path of Veracocha. But it's, it's everywhere. The Indians talked about the star people. You know, uh, Genesis 6, you have the, the, the sons of God, the fallen angels, the B'nai Ha'i Elohim. It's just, it's every culture throughout history has the same story. It's just amazing. Yeah. Um, yeah, so the Inca called them Viracocha. Uh, Aztecs called it Quetzalcoatl. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there was another name, but yeah, you're right onto it, man. The path of Veracocha. I mean, it's crazy. The oral traditions even speak of Veracocha like this white skinned deity, you know, with these beards that came down and taught, uh, taught them civilization. Right. And, um, then disappeared over the sea. And that's one of the reasons that made uh, the Spanish conquest so easy, because the literally when the, when the Spanish came into Cusco, they literally only had, I believe, a hundred or so soldiers. The Inca had thousands, tens of thousands. It should have been no contest. Why was it so easy for the Spanish? The Spanish had white skin, beards. When the Inca saw them. They thought this was Veracocha returning and they welcomed them with open arms. And, um, it's pretty sad, you know, cause the, yeah. the Spanish, you know, basically, um, told the emperor at the time, I'm blanking on his name, you know, give us your gold and we won't kill you. And, um, so he gave them the gold they had and sent, couriers out to tell all the other um, Inca rulers, bring gold so I'm not killed. And they brought him all the gold. Well, then they killed him anyway. So, you know, it was, it was very brutal and, and a sad, sad thing. And what the, what the Spanish did, you know, wiping out the history in just a bloody way was just so crazy. But even, the uh, Spanish Progress, chroniclers, right? Yeah, the Spanish chroniclers themselves write about the stuff they found. You know, like um, I've been talking about these elongated skull mummies that the Inca worshipped. Some of the Spanish chroniclers talk about giant elongated skulls, skulled mummies they found in caves that the Inca were worshiping. And so, um, Timothy Alberino has done some great research on that breaking down all the giant lore that we can gather from the, from the chroniclers who wrote about it themselves, Pizarro in their own um, books and writings. And so, um, and then again, talking to tour guides in Egypt, the ones that will tell you the real history, the history is chock full of giants. And so this was a part of their belief system too, that, um, Giants had something to do with building the biggest megalithic walls. So it's just amazing. <laughs> it's just, uh, and the more you look, it's, uh, the, what we know as the facts are just, uh, totally twisted. And what we're told is, is fiction is it, closer to the actual facts. It's just amazing. Well, Derek, thank you for coming on. Uh, I really appreciate your time. Just uh, for those listening that want to uh, find your your website, your tour information, YouTube channel, let everybody know where they can find you and your material. Yeah. Um, I used to go by the name Megalithic Marvels. 
I changed that to Stargate Voyager recently due to uh, some censorship issues I was having. So most of my stuff can be found. My blog is StargateVoyager.com now and my YouTube, Instagram, it's all, you know, Stargate Voyager, Twitter, X. So yeah, you can follow me there, connect. Um, and yeah, if you're interested in tours, it's just StargateVoyager.com slash tours. We've got a couple we're doing this year. And so, uh, yeah, I just love to tell everybody, keep, keep uh, researching, keep exploring. And I feel like we're turning the tide on ancient history and, um, helping people see there's a whole lot more than we've been led to believe. And uh, that's important because when you realize there's more to history, you start asking, well, how'd they do it? And when you ask how they do it, you realize, well, they had technology. And if you're asking, well, why did they have technology? Well, then you're asking, well, where'd it go? Right? And the last thing I'll say is in Egypt, for example, you've got these massive pyramids, but then you've got massive megalithic temples like the Valley Temple right next to the Sphinx. This thing has got a completely different function than the pyramid, yet it's got the same massive rose granite blocks. The pyramid of the, the function of the pyramid looks like it was some kind of, you know, generator or something where this temple was made for ancient peoples or, or humanoids, whatever you want to call them. And what they were doing was, again, if you look at the dynastic Egyptian oral traditions, and these temples were healing centers. They didn't need meds. They didn't need uh, to be jabbed. They would enter these fertility and healing centers, and they would come in one side and they would pass through again the magnetism the specific stones they were regenerating their bodies and um, again that's part of the reason I believe for the cover up of history right mm. ain't no uh, prophets and cures are they yeah if you if if we if we have that kind of technology you know how to harness it that uh, would cripple a lot of industries that make a whole lot of money, right? And so um, that's why I think this is so important. So it's been awesome being with you, Justin. Thanks for the invite. I hope everybody enjoyed this. And um, this is going to be an exciting year to be alive. That's for sure. That's right. All right, guys, thank you for tuning in. hope you enjoyed the episode. Be sure to check out uh, Derek's channel. And until uh, next time, torches high, guys.